Uh, so today I'm going to talk about something that uh, I'm calling the pseudonymous economy. Uh, and you know, I want to motivate it. Uh, you know, why should we want this thing? And then how might we uh, build it? So without further ado, let me just jump in. So first, you know, we're going to talk about what is pseudonymity, then why is pseudonymous economy? How might it work? How could we build it? So what is pseudonymity? It is, um, <clears throat> it is not anonymity. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about a real name, you know, for example, on Facebook, people typically use real names. On 4chan, people are typically anonymous. But on places like Reddit and uh, sometimes Twitter, people are pseudonymous, where they have a name that is sort of a persistent kind of thing that gains reputation associated with it, but it's not a real name. It's not your global unique identifier that you use on official forums. And, um, you know, the, the concept here of pseudonymity uh, the reason it's important to distinguish from anonymity is that pseudonymity provides accountability, but as we'll see, it's, it's also a shield against character assassination. So one of the reasons I, I, I wanted to talk about this and, and direct people's attention towards this is I believe pseudonymity is as important as decentralization, albeit under, uh, you know, kind of focused on. And the reason is that while the Bitcoin network was decentralized, Satoshi Nakamoto was also pseudonymous, and that meant that the state couldn't play either the man or the ball. Okay, so it meant that you couldn't go after the person, you know, who built the network, and you couldn't shut down the network itself. And it was critical in the early days of Bitcoin. And we're seeing some of, you know, sort of the opposite of that now with like government hearings on, on Libra and so on. If you have a highly named network and it's centralized, you've got kind of both, uh, both points vulnerable. So pseudonymity is as important as decentralization, especially for certain kinds of applications. And um, one important concept is pseudonymity is not a zero one, it's a continuum. So there's this really powerful concept called 33 bits by Arvind Narayanan. Uh, he popularized it as a prophet at Princeton. And the basic idea is that two to the 33rd power is eight billion, or a little more than eight billion, 8.6. And there's only seven something billion people in the world. So with 33 independent bits of information, you can de-anonymize somebody. Now, if, if they have zero bits of anonymity uh, left, then you know exactly who they are. But if they have, let's say, 10 bits of anonymity left, they're one out of two to the 10th people, so about one out of 1024. Uh, if, if they have 20 bits of anonymity left, they're one out of you know, two to the 20th, so about one out of a million. And so in this fashion, you can try to say, okay, you know, I have, a, I have a number of bits of pseudonymity, a number of bits of anonymity, um, and it's a continuum as opposed to being a totally zero, one discrete thing. Now, pseudonymity is already mainstream. I guess everybody saw, you know, Pierre Delicto from last week, uh, which is Mitt Romney, but James Comey was also using a pseudonym uh, online. And this is happening at the very, you know, most, most senior levels of government, but it's also happening, um, you know, among like Gen Z teenagers, uh, kids will set up uh, so-called Finsta and Rinstas, you know, like a fake Instagram account under a fake name and a real Instagram account under a real name. And what's funny is they're their fake self under their real name. They're in their Sunday best or their bar, bar mitzvah clothing or what have you, and they're smiling for the camera. And they're their real self under their fake name. And so these, uh, both kids and adults alike, have fashioned these search-resistant identities where um, you have hundreds of millions of people, like Reddit alone is several hundred million, uh, who use pseudonyms on a daily basis, and they do so not to commit crimes or anything like that, but simply to be able to discuss without retaliation. And so pseudonymity is already mainstream. You know, over the last 10, 20 years, we, we've built up hundreds of millions of people who use sometimes multiple pseudonyms. Uh, and I think the big next step is gonna be not just pseudonymous communication, but pseudonymous transaction. So this is where I think society is going, um, and there's several like kind of correlated vectors towards this. At the top is Google, multiple account support. Um, every major you know, social media company, tech company, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Google, et cetera, now offers multiple account support, if only to allow you to move between your, your individual account and your corporate account for placing ads or issuing corporate tweets or what have you. But that's now actually something that's very common. Many people have multiple accounts and they just use them in different contexts. So that's one big driver, is just the technological support for it across many different services. The second driver is employment law, where increasingly people don't want to even inadvertently discriminate against somebody, so you won't ask about marital status or immigration status or you know, other kinds of things in a job interview. 
Um, and, and the third reason for pseudonymity is uh, basically social media mobs, which can attack you and debit your reputation, um, and, and you have no recourse. So these are kind of three different vectors that are sort of pushing in towards why people would want to use pseudonyms um, you know, online and in employment context and, and so on. Okay, so that's kind of what is pseudonymity and give some initial motivation. Why a pseudonymous economy? So, you know, there's this guy, Yakov Smirnov, you know, in, in the 80s, and he had this one-liner which said, you know, in the Soviet Union, we, we also have freedom of speech, but in America, you have freedom after speech. Okay, so the, the, the point of pseudonymity is it allows freedom after speech. You can't retaliate against a person, you can only retaliate against their ideas, and, uh, you know, that's why, you know, with Satoshi Nakamoto, um, basically, uh, the, the man or the woman or the people who did this uh, they can be denounced under the name Satoshi Nakamoto praised. This cloud of millions of articles swirls around the pseudonym, but the person walks unscathed. You know, you, without, a, without a real name, you have no GPS location, you can't send in the drones. Um, so, you know, when we talk about freedom after speech, social media mobs are now routine. Um, you know, this is, this is something which anybody who's posted on social media has, has seen this. And, um, the, the way of thinking about it is negative press on social media. It actually, it's not true that sticks and stones can you know, break your bones, but words can never hurt you. The way that it works is negative press, negative social media is an attack on your social network. And this visual over here, I think, encapsulates one of the reasons why one would want a pseudonym. Um, if, for example, you have friends uh, or, or partners, employers, uh, investors, customers, who read and respect a particular news outlet, that news outlet, when they publish an article saying that you, know, you are now a bad person, um, has right access to their brains. If they read and respect this news outlet um, and they see that you're now a bad person, uh, well, in the after scenario, uh, you know, some of them break ties, the, the investor doesn't you know, uh, like, like close, the, close the deal, the employee quits, and the third person may not totally quit or break the deal, but they may retreat to what is contractually obligated. Um, and so in this fashion, like negative press, negative social media, it's like a, it's like a mortar landing in your social network. It frays the ties, breaks the ties. But if instead the um, article is announcing your pseudonym, uh, now um, it doesn't matter, you, you walk unscathed. There's no damage done to your social network. Uh, nobody can, nobody knows, nobody can map it. Um, the, the concept of too much information you know, is, is now applicable. And basically the way I think about this is pseudonymity defends against social supply chain disruptions. In the same way that you've got a supply chain disruption for a component, if you're a hardware manufacturer, you know, like uh, are, are my, um, is my uh, rare earth elements, are they arriving on time, or, you know, that kind of thing, my, my, my glass. Uh, your, your social network also has a supply chain and your key investor, your key employee, your key customer, they can't go south on you as easily if uh, what is being denounced is your pseudonym as opposed to you. Okay, so how might, how might a pseudonymous economy work? Um, well, the, the way I think about it is your bank account is your stored wealth, but your real name is your stored reputation. And one sort of visual is, you know, you, as you accumulate wealth in your bank account, the number goes up. Um, on Twitter, which we're gonna use as like a working example, it's, it's certainly not everything, but it's, a, it's at least one slice of the, of the problem. You know, as you kind of tweet, you, you accumulate followers. So it's like your stored reputation. And while only you can debit your bank account, um, you know, by entering in your PIN, anybody can debit your reputation. Um, you know, there's a, there's a funny uh, tweet which says, uh, on Twitter, uh, every day there's a main character and your goal is to never be it. Okay, I think that's funny. Um, so, you know, we, we, one way to deal with this is to separate out your earning, your speaking, and your real names. Um, so your real name would just be used on uh, official forms, like, a, like your social security number. You don't just disclose that casually, you use that on official forms, um, you know, when the government needs, needs that official input. When speaking, you use a pseudonym, like Comfortably Smug or, or someone like that. And when earning, um, and this is the new part, you would earn under a pseudonym, uh, you might have a GitHub handle under that, you basically just have a professional identity, and what you would you know, tweet about or speak about is something that's relevant to that professional identity. 
Um, and you know, you don't have to have just like one earning and one speaking and one real name. You might have only one real name, but you might have many different speaking names, many different earning names, just like in the same way that you might use uh, separate credit cards for every um, uh, you know, like, like merchant that you, you um, uh, buy from. Uh, you know, privacy.com allows that, the new Apple card allows that. It kind of gives a default privacy in the same way that you might use multiple emails like your name plus foo uh, to go and sign up at a website to give some kind of isolation and scoping, you could use different names for different contexts. And so as a way of sort of formulating a technical problem, we can already move wealth to a pseudonym. Can we move reputation as well? In the top right, you can see, um, you know, take $100,000 in USD, uh, you can buy Zcash at, at Coinbase, for example, and you can have 50K left under your real name, and you can move 50K to a pseudonym. Um, so we can now transfer wealth to a pseudonym. The question is, can we transfer some reputation to a pseudonym? So for example, in the bottom is Mark Anderson, 700K followers. Um, could it be possible to set up an account where uh, you know, the original account stays with 700K followers, but there's a new pseudonymous account that has like 100K followers or, or something like that? Is it possible to trade off some reputation uh, in return for some anonymity rather than all versus all? And so I'll give a cryptographic construction, kind of a thought experiment here uh, as to how we might build something like this. So let's take the special case of Twitter. You know, in, in Twitter, you have both real names and pseudonyms you know, coexisting. Um, and we're gonna sort of describe, like over the next few slides, uh, a few constructions that'll get us to like a special crypto Twitter. Um, this is the kind of thing that people in crypto are thinking about, people are building. Um, there's a few primitives, new primitives you need to, um, to build for this. So we'll start kind of application first and then describe what you need on the back end. So just to motivate, um, you know, we talked earlier about how pseudonymity can be quantified in bits on the x-axis. Uh, and also we can, we're gonna quantify reputation the number of followers on the y-axis. And right now you kind of have two choices. Either you can have uh, zero pseudonymity um, and all your followers, so you're operating under your real name, or you can have total pseudonymity and no followers and just set up a new you know, like fake account or pseudonymous account. And so an interesting question is, is there something in the middle? Can we trade off some degree of pseudonymity for some, you know, to, to gain some followers? Or is, there, is there something between those two extreme points? And um, yeah, that's what I meant about the information you need to identify, the 33 bits. So we, can we turn off some pseudonymity for some distribution? And here's a naive approach, okay? So uh, this data structure here, it's called you know, the adjacency matrix in a graph. Um, in the upper left, we see you know, kind of an individual, uh, in this case, Mark, and you know, he's got four people pointing into him, and those are represented in the first row by four ones, because those folks are pointing him into him, they're following him, um, rather than vice versa. So it's asymmetric matrix. Now, if we did the most naive approach where a new pseudonym was booted up and all of the followers were ported over to that new pseudonym, the problem is that anybody who was analyzing this uh, graph would see that the vector of followers was the same between these two people, um, basically that, you know, that they're really part of the same network, and you could, you could see that those two patterns were extremely similar of zeros and ones, and so there would be effectively zero, um, zero pseudonymity. You, you wouldn't have any, any bits of pseudonymity. Um, so, so that's bad, uh, and so the naive approach of simply setting up a new account and transferring all your followers to it doesn't work. Okay, can we do something smarter? What if we transfer attestations, fungible attestations, rather than the entire non-fungible list of followers? And so how would that work? So if we go back to you know, a Twitter profile, there's kind of three types of data there. There's the data that is put there by the platform, like the user's verification. There's a data which is stated by the individual themselves, like their, you know, their name, their location, their bio. And there's data that is uh, input by third parties, like the followers, the likes, and their RTs. The first and the third are actually relatively hard to fake. The second, like the name, location, and bio, you know, that's just self-attestation, so it's not, it's not as uh, secure. But let's focus on the first one, the, the verification. What we could do is we could set up something where um, you know, Mark sets up a new pseudonym, and then does a zero knowledge attestation if, if the back end of this new crypto Twitter allowed it. That would push over the, the bit that says that he's a verified user. Okay, 
So we linger on that. So essentially, you're moving something from one account to another account, like a zero knowledge attestation. And what's cool about this is that if we think about it from the perspective of how much pseudonymity you're giving up, in, in the first case, you're you know, completely unique. You have zero bits of you know, pseudonymity, anonymity. In the second case, uh, if you're just a pure new um, you know, fake account or pseudonymous account, uh, you could be any one of the 330 million MAUs on Twitter. So you have about 28 something bits of anonymity. But there's about 330,000 verified users. So if you move over that bit of verification, you're now one of 330,000 verifieds. You've given up 10 bits of anonymity. And so we can now quantify the trade off between pseudonymity and reputation. And that's new, and that's really, I think, interesting and powerful, because that variants of this can be applied to all major social networks and, and, and so on. OK. So we're making progress. We've got a construction um, that will move over the fungible fields where other people share them. There's other people who share that verified flag, as opposed to the non-fungible follower vector, which other people do not share. OK. So but now you know, the obvious question arises, uh, well, can we do more? Yes, of course we can do more. You could also port over um, you know, the fact that you have more than 100K followers under one account, or that you're followed by Jack, or, or something like that. And each such attestation that you port over, um, you can determine prior to porting it how much of a pseudonymity decrease it is. Of course, if, if Jack only follows you know, one person, you have de-anonymized yourself by, by doing this, but you can see that prior to porting over that, that attestation. Um, and of course, it's not you know, just uh, it's some degree combinatorial. If you have 100,000 followers and Jack follows you, um, that is less anonymity than either one of those independently. So you just have to calculate the, the joint distribution. OK, very doable. But there's another problem that now arises, which is, OK, we've set up this new thing. It's got this verification and these other kinds of attestations um, attached to it. How do we get followers for this? Um, and so there's, there's another kind of construction which we'll, which we'll want, which is something I call autofollow. So the idea here is that um, folks would be on a network like this in order to hear from pseudonymous accounts in part. And so they would set up a flag which is like, okay, I'll autofollow anybody who is, uh, has poured over verification, who's, who's got more than you know, 10K followers, who uh, you know, if, if Jack follows them, any pseudonymous account that boots up like this is kind of interesting. It's, it's just like you could follow a person or you could follow a hashtag. You could follow pseudonymous accounts that have a certain level of, of, um, of these attestations. And so now you set up a, a pseudonym and uh, you move over verification. And now because those three people have autofollow set up for verification, boom, you get some followers. Uh, and this is not that hard to implement if this is how the network is set up. But this would now start to have something where people could use pseudonyms on kind of a, uh, a more reasonable level and they could actually pull over some of their distribution. Moreover, they could know of their existing followers how many were set up to autofollow uh, accounts that had particular attestations associated with them. So you could calculate how much followers you'd get for a particular pseudonym. Okay, so let's assume that like 150K um, of the 700K followers have this autofollow set up. So now in this case, we have a construction which yields an intermediate identity. Um, it doesn't have the full 700K, it has 150K that have autofollow set up. It doesn't have full anonymity of 28.3 bits of being one of 330 million people, it's one of 330,000 people, but still that's pretty good, right? Um, we, we have, uh, you know, we can quantify the reduction in anonymity due to porting over the attestation, and we can quantify how much distribution you retain due to autofollow, and this gives you a way of sort of configuring a anonymity reputation trade-off, and you can negotiate other points along that line. Now, this means we can now move both wealth and reputation to a pseudonym by kind of implementing these two new sort of back-end constructs. And there's different ways of doing this. You might set up a new crypto Twitter where you get a bunch of folks to move over there. Um, there's a degree of strength in numbers, so you want to have a large enough critical mass. So that part I, I kind of leave as um, something we're going to have to build over the next 10, 10, maybe 20 years. But so, you know, I'm well aware, you know, kind of if, you, if you're a physicist, there's this concept of assume a spherical cow and everything's become simple. So sort of assuming a crypto Twitter makes things simple, but this is sort of a motivational kind of thing. And I think it's interesting for crypto devs to think about uh, an important feature of a crypto social network. So a bunch of people are building these things. 
So just in summary, we discussed what is pseudonymity. You know, you've got your real name, your pseudonym, and your anonym, and those are three different things. The pseudonym has persistent reputation. Um, we talked about, you know, why you'd want a pseudonymous economy, and the answer is by separating out your earning and your speaking names, um, having some social media attack on you doesn't affect your, you know, daily economics. It doesn't affect your, your social network supply chain. How could it work? We separate out your earning, your speaking, and your real names, and we build it with this cryptographic construct or something similar that allows you to trade off some anonymity for some reputation. And I'm open to other ways of accomplishing this beyond the one that I outlined, but I just wanted to at least set up the problem and provide you know, one sort of thought experiment solution. Okay, so that's it, and you can follow me on Twitter if you, if you like this stuff. Apologies, thanks. I think we have time for a question or two if people want to, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, the question was, how do you handle uh, offline to online? Um, and I think the thing is, if you're offline, it's sort of hard to operate under a pseudonym um, because you can be face recognized and, and so on and so forth. Um, there's folks who have worked on this with like CV Dazzle, like makeup that makes you face recognition resistant. Um, I'd say that, like, I don't have a good solution for that yet. Just have think about the online part right now. Great question. So, her, her question is, how do you handle the the issue of? content analysis. For example, um, Joe Klein in the 90s wrote this book, Primary Colors, and was eventually de-anonymized with something called stylometric de-anonymization, where you can go and analyze the frequency of stop words, other kinds of things, and figure out who they are. Um, well, one answer is there's new AI techniques called style transfer. And just like you can transfer the style of uh, like, a, like a wallpaper to another image, um, you can also have a style transfer thing that would have you write like Hemingway or write like Jane Austen. So you write your normal text, you punch it through style transfer, and it will translate it not into another language, but into the argo of another kind of speaker. Um, and, and that's kind of an interesting way of sort of defeating stylometric de-anonymization. Um, look at my Twitter. I, 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 there's a paper that I linked. Look, Bology has stylometric de-anonymization. I don't think it's, it's like, a, um, I don't think there's a production one yet out there, but the papers are out there, so you can implement it. How do you keep people from selling the child accounts they spin up? Um, well, it is, uh, it is certainly possible to do that. I, I actually, I don't even think that's necessarily bad. Um, it just means that you have somewhat less trust in you know, that, that user's kind of utterances or what have you. Um, you might do something where, at least at the platform level, you link it to the same private key um, with, their, with their main account. And then if so, uh, you know, you could, you could do something where they would be giving up their money or their access to their money by doing that. There's various kinds of constructions. I think that's a good question. In, oh, what could the identity be in free private cities? Uh, stay tuned. <laughs> um, so the identity in free private cities, I think, um, I think what's going to happen is that Social media and cryptocurrency are causing the unbundling and rebundling of the nation state. Um, and that's, that's like a 20 or 30 or 40 year kind of voyage, and we're just at the beginning of that. Um, and I think over time, what you're going to find are you're going to have uh, cryptocurrencies that are integrated with like, the fabric of a nation state. And that's, you know, Estonia is kind of like one of the first along the, the, this line with the, the digital you know, uh, residency. I think you're going to see much more like that. Okay, thanks. <laughs>